Now hear the word of the Lord from 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was also raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all his angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning, soldier, and peace be with you. Uh, It's good to see you guys this morning. Uh, If you're visiting with us, welcome. My name is Jonah. I'm one of the pastors here at Sojourn. Our mission as a church, what we're trying to do here is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus. Uh, Gospel just means good news. So this is good news being announced of what Jesus has done, of who he is. And then we want to build one another up as his church and send each other to follow him as instruments of truth, beauty, and goodness. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, Give it up one time for the dads. Father's Day. Come on. Come on, Dad. Uh, We got a baker screaming in the background. Nice job. Good job, Dad. Um, My dad is a member of this church, which is cool and strange. All at the same time, might be listening on the road right now. He's not here this morning to give you a window into my father. Uh, Last night, he was inducted into the Ohio Athletics Hall of Fame. Lee Sage. Lee Sage. Uh, Yep, he is good at everything. So to know my dad is to be blessed. I'm thankful that he's my dad. Uh, If you know him, if you have his cell phone, send him a text message. He's going to be coy about the whole Hall of Fame thing, and he'll make up some excuse. But it's a big deal. It's a major award, right? Uh, Yeah, Ohio Sports Hall of Flame. Hall of Flame. Good grief. Um, Yeah, so I love my dad, and I'm thankful he is my dad. Um, Yeah, uh, we've got a couple of weeks left in this series, Orthodoxy. Uh, guardrails for the thriving soul, where we're trying to understand the creeds. Why are we a creedal church? Why do we talk about creeds? What do they have to do with our lives? And we really have some wonderful books at the book table. If this has been something that you've been curious about, uh, if you want something that's devotionally oriented around the creeds, or you want to learn more history of how they came about, uh, the the books will be there for a couple of more weeks, so I encourage you to check that out um, on your way home. Or you can copy the title and see if you can find a deal somewhere, Uh, whatever you want. They're really great books. Uh, I want to begin our time with um, a simple question, but a difficult question. Uh, What do you do, you personally, you don't have to say it out loud, but just think about it for a moment. What do you do when you don't feel safe? What do you do when you don't feel safe? Um, if, If you watch the news or if you have children in public schools, uh, you've, you've probably seen debates raging in the last weeks and months about what to do in our schools when we don't feel safe. Um, evil people keep entering into our schools uh, to harm our most precious and our most vulnerable ones. And we adults are left wondering, what do we do when we don't feel safe? Uh, there's, there's many people in our country who want to put weapons in the hands of teachers. You've heard this, right? You've heard this debate. Um, Some of us, when we don't feel safe, we respond to fear and danger uh, by increasing firepower in some form, by building up our defenses. A recent study, I found this fascinating. Um, Thousands of public school teachers were surveyed about whether they think it would be a good idea to arm our teachers. And the vast majority said they think this would make our schools less safe. Only one in five teachers believed that arming our teachers was a good idea. Only one in five thought arming our teachers would make our schools safer. So what should we do? Um, That same survey asked public school teachers, what's your number one safety concern for your students? What's the thing you're most worried about? And the overwhelming majority of teachers reported that their number one safety concern was bullying bullying from other children. Uh, The author of that report, Dr. Heather Schwartz, 
Uh, she said bullying, not active shooters, was teachers' most common safety concern. Uh, in second place was fighting. In third place was drug use. Um, so whichever one of those three issues you want to deal with, what do you do when you don't feel safe? What do you do when you are worried your children aren't safe? Some of us, when we feel threatened, we, we want to fight back. We take an aggressive posture towards the world around us. But not everybody is that way. Uh, some of us, when we don't feel safe, we instead of kind of going out, we, we go in. Instead of getting upset, we, we want to calm down. So while some parts of the country are saying, let's get more guns out there, um, things on the other end of the spectrum, things to help us calm down are on the rise too. Marijuana use is on the rise. Uh, it's kind of watered down cousin Delta 8 is on the rise. These things we're reaching to to help us calm down. So where some, some of us want to get aggressive and fight back, others of us want to shut down or numb out. Um, escapism, the many forms that we take to try to escape the pressures of reality, nearly every form of escapism is on the rise. What do you do when you don't feel safe? Every one of us has a strategy to feel safe. And this isn't bad. It's not wrong to want to feel safe. Uh, safety is kind of the fundamental human need. It's not wrong to want to feel safe. Have you ever noticed the relationship between feeling safe and the decisions you make? And how it seems that the, the less safe you feel, the less helpful and productive your decisions are. When you get scared, you tend to make more irrational, more destructive decisions. So what do you do? What do you do when you don't feel safe? Do you fight back? Do you numb out? Do you shut down? What, what's kind of confusing about this reality is, again, I, I don't know how much of your guys' week you spend reading sociological survey data. Um, but if you just go by the numbers, things like lifespan or violent crimes, uh, we live here in the West, in the United States, we live in a time where people are safer and healthier than we have ever been in human history, ever. If you're like, man, I wish we lived in a safe society, you are currently living in the safest society humans have ever built. And paradoxically, by the numbers, we are living in the most anxious time in human history. So we live in this world right now where we have never been as safe as we are, and we have never been as scared as we are. Into that society where there's plenty of things to be afraid of, you guys perhaps have forgotten, but a couple of years ago, something unseen and unexpected came and imploded our whole world. Something we could not be, you guys remember what I'm talking about? We cannot be prepared for things we cannot see. You cannot be prepared for cancer. You cannot be prepared for a pandemic. We cannot be prepared for every tragedy. And maybe some of you have learned this by now. You cannot plan your way out of fear. And we are not the first people in human history to face unexpected fears. So in our Western world, we have plenty of things right in front of us that we can name, we can touch, we can see, and say, that's something to be afraid of. And then if you're willing to read the Bible as it presents itself, fighting the temptation to edit it into an American document and not an ancient Middle Eastern document with different assumptions and different perspectives, if you're willing to read the Bible as it presents itself, it tells you there's a whole nother world out there that you cannot see filled with things to be afraid of. The scriptures call it the unseen realm. And it's a realm where a cosmic battle of good and evil is playing out beyond the realm of our own awareness. At, at one point, the, uh, the Apostle Paul encourages us this way. He says, put on all of God's armor. Why? So that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Uh, 
We don't think about this much, do we? Right? I mean, when was the last time you were walking down the street and you were like, man, I got to be on guard against the unseen realm today? Uh, typically, you don't have to actually do this right now, but typically in our very sophisticated, advanced society, we tend to roll our eyes at the idea of an unseen realm, or we roll our eyes at the idea of demons or evil spiritual forces. Uh, but they didn't. They, meaning the people who've come before us, they, meaning the Apostle Paul, they, meaning our Jewish ancestors, our, our brothers and sisters. Uh, the early church didn't roll their eyes at this idea. And, and so here, here's the scenario I'm, I'm trying to help you feel right now. You and I have plenty of things to be afraid of. When, when the disciples said to Jesus they were afraid of something or they were worried about something, he didn't say there was nothing to worry about. Do you remember this story? He said, there's just plenty to worry about tomorrow, so just worry about what there is to worry about today. He never says there isn't anything to worry about. We have plenty that we can see and touch and identify to be worried about. Now, the Bible says there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't see that you should be worried about, too. The Bible tells us there's a world we can't see filled with evil spiritual forces that want to do you and me harm. So, again, I say to you, what do you do when you don't feel safe? What are we to do in a world so filled with dangers, seen and unseen? As we've said every week in the series through the creeds, confusion creates chaos, uncertainty and anxiety. Chaos left unresolved produces carnage, damage, destruction. The creeds, as we have seen, provide us the clarity we need, and clarity create safety. Into our confusion, the creeds remind us of what is real and what is true, and they help us to stop chasing ghosts. They, they free us from the anxiety of creating plans. And if you're like me and you deal with some anxiety, you make your plan, and then you lay in bed at night coming up with the backup plans for when your plan doesn't work, and then by the morning you've got backups to your backup plans to your backup plans and all of these order of operations, and, and then eventually you realize you cannot plan your way out of anxiety. You cannot plan your way out of fear. Ultimately, these creeds invite us to follow Jesus, not repeat words mindlessly, not treat the creeds like a spell to cast over all of our problems, but to embody them that we might live them. And so the New Testament, we, we started in the New Testament last week, a New Testament creed, and we have another this morning. They provide simple, memorable antidotes to the chaos of confusion. Humans cannot thrive under chaos, under anxiety, any more than we could survive trips on the highway with no speed limits, no rules, no lanes, and no guardrails. So ultimately, what I want you to hear me say this morning is the creeds remind us that Jesus will bring us safely home. Jesus will bring us safely home. Let me show you. 1 Peter 3.18 begins this way, and this is the part that Christians like us really like. Some of you probably memorized this verse, then everybody leaves the weird stuff alone. A whole bunch of weird stuff is coming, I promise you, but let's, go, let's get verse 18 first. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Safely home to God. Um, guilt. Guilt is pain over something you have done. And it can be real or perceived. You don't always feel guilty when you should feel guilty. There is this thing called false guilt. Uh, I will tell you, though, your body doesn't know the difference between real guilt and false guilt. The, whether it's real or perceived, guilt is pain, and pain feels like danger. Guilt makes you feel unsafe. So maybe another way to answer the question, what do you do when you don't feel safe? What do you do when you, don't, when you feel guilty? when you feel the pain over something you've done. Um, in my decade plus here in Southern Indiana, something I've learned is that everyone in Floyd County is a good person. Have you heard this? You talk to somebody, tell me about your mom. She's a good person. Tell me about your brother. He's such a good person. And what do we mean by that here? We mean that there are, this is very Egyptian. I don't know if anyone in Southern Indiana realizes this, but we have two scales. On one scale is the good stuff you've done, and the other scale is the bad stuff you've done. What does it mean to be a good person? It means the good scale is heavier than the bad scale. You guys know this, right? I'm not talking crazy, right? 
I need some help this morning. Okay, guys. Um, and so when you do more bad stuff and the bad stuff gets heavier than the good stuff, that is what we call guilt. And so what do you do? Well, I need to put more stuff on the good side. And so I really screwed up on Tuesday. So Wednesday morning, I'm going to go serve at the, the homeless shelter. And Wednesday afternoon, I'm going to mow my neighbor's lawn. And Wednesday night, I'm going to bring a meal to the new mom in our church. And then by the end of the day, I will have balanced my scales out. You understand this kind of thinking, right? And, and so what's the strategy there for guilt? I will work my way out of it. I will do more good things so that my scales tip the other way. If that's you, you don't have to raise your hand, but if that's you, have you noticed yet that no amount of achievement or success, no matter how tipped you feel like your scale is, how that somehow doesn't manage to wipe away the pain of the guilt that you're feeling? Um, if you're a greedy person, have you noticed that no matter how much you give away, it doesn't ease the pain of how guilty you feel? Um, if, if you've said, uh, a harsh word in haste to your wife, for instance. Have you noticed that there is no bouquet of flowers nice enough to make you feel better about that thing that you said? No amount of achievement or success can wipe away the guilt over past failures. The voice keeps reminding you of what you've done. You're driving down the street and this voice comes into your head and it's like, remember that thing you did seven years ago? I just wanted to remind you, you're terrible. You've had this happen to you, right? It's not just me. If that guilt keeps rolling long enough, it'll eventually bleed over into everything, and you begin feeling guilty about everything, regardless if it's your responsibility. I've met people who feel guilty about the direction the wind blows. A tree gets knocked over in their yard, and somehow they feel bad, like this is something that I failed in. And Again, maybe a bit paradoxically, have you noticed how hard it can be to come to Jesus when you're feeling so guilty? What is the heart of the gospel? You are helpless in need of rescue, and Jesus has come and rescued you. And yet we make mistakes and we fail, and in, in that failure, is it not so difficult in our world to see that that is the time to come to Jesus? When I feel broken and messy and needy and helpful or helpless, it can be so difficult to come to Jesus. Peter's creed reminds us, though, that our guilt is paid in full. We sing this all the time. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's what we confess. That's what we sing to those suffering the weight of guilt that makes them feel unsafe. The creeds remind you that you are safe because Christ suffered, did you notice the, the word? Christ suffered for our sins once for all time, meaning there are no more sacrifices required. There is no more achievement required of you to pay for your guilt, to make you safe. You are safe, why? Because you are forgiven. Well, why am I forgiven? Because Christ has died for sinners. Why, why would he do that? The creed tells us to bring you safely home to God not to make your homecoming possible, not to say, hey, I know you really screwed up on Tuesday. Here's 57 things to do to make up for it this week. Good luck. You can try again. It doesn't say a possibility. It's an announcement that something good has happened. He will bring you safely home to God. You are safe. You are loved. You can come to Jesus. He didn't come to give you a fresh start, but to finish the work. We love verse 18, and rightfully so. But after that, things get so weird. Verse 19 says, So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So Christ suffered in his body, and then it, the creed tells us he was made alive in the spirit. What was stop one for Jesus? To, to preach to the who and the where? The spirits in prison? The Bible attests to a supernatural world, again, an unseen realm, powers and principalities, evil authorities. Christ has handled your guilt. He removed and covered your failures. But have you noticed that not feeling guilty is not the same as feeling safe? You can feel not guilty and still feel 
unsafe. Do you guys remember the tornado like a month ago? All the sirens going off in Floyd County, you guys remember this, yes? Um, I live in a very old house with no basement. And so the sirens went off, where did we go? We came here to the church basement and huddled there in the hallway over there in the kids wing next to the church hall where there's not many windows. There was not one ounce of me that felt responsible for the tornado. I did not feel guilty about the tornado. Uh, but I will be honest, I did not feel safe. I remember sitting in my office scrolling Twitter when I learned that the NCAA canceled March Madness because of the pandemic. Do you remember this? I was looking at my phone and it said March Madness canceled due to the pandemic and I said, oh no, A audibly. In no way am I responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. I didn't have anything to do with it. I was not guilty one bit over COVID, but I did not feel safe. You can be forgiven and still not feel safe, especially if you ever have an encounter with these evil powers of the unseen realm. So who are they? Verse 19 continues, they are those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. If you're curious about this, or if you've never heard this before, and you're like, what in the world is happening right now? We did a whole sermon series on this about a year ago called Desecrated. You can get on our podcast and listen to it. You can download the app, and it's really easy to find under sermon audio. We spent six weeks or something talking about this. You can, you can go learn more about it. To put it simply, there were a group of rebels from the heavenly realm at work during the days of Noah trying to subvert God's plan for creation. They're one of the primary reasons that God flooded the earth. After the flood, God imprisoned them. Having claimed victory over death and sin, Jesus' first stop was to descend to this prison and announce his victory over these spiritual rebels. Believers in Jesus' day, this may sound crazy to you, in our churches, if someone says, what's wrong with the world today? We usually appeal to Genesis 3, right? The fall. We rebelled against God. And that's true, and that's a big problem in the world. If we went back in time to Jesus' day and asked random Jewish person, what's wrong with the world today? They would have said, well, there was the, 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 re the rebellion against God from humans in Genesis 3, and there was the rebellion against God in the spiritual realm in Genesis 6. They would have believed, they would have argued that the demonic invasion of Genesis 6 was one of the fundamental causes of the world's problems, as fundamental as Adam and Eve's rebellion in the garden. And so they believed and held on to the hope that if Messiah were to ever come, he would need to once and for all end this rebellion. He was entrusted to protect his people from the forces of evil, these unseen forces in the spiritual realm. So this creed, memorized and recited as the church gathered, reminds us that not only are you safe from the consequences of your sin, you are forgiven and it has been paid for, it also reminds us that you are safe from your spiritual oppressors too. Peter tells us that baptism is like the floodwaters, and now it's the blood of Jesus that has become for us Noah's Ark. What rich imagery to describe what Jesus has done for us. Conscience cleansed, effective because of Christ's resurrection. To be baptized means you agree with the total victory of Christ. And I'm, can I nerd out on you guys for a second? I don't know if anybody's going to care, but I'm going to talk theology and doctrine here for a second. Uh, what happened at the cross is a big point of conversation through a few thousand years of church history. And the different opinions on what happened at the cross are called theories of the atonement. Dun, dun, dun. Big words. What do we mean? What happened at the cross? Churches like ours typically argue for a penal substitutionary atonement theory of the cross. Have you guys heard this phrase before? Penal substitutionary atonement. Penal, meaning it was, there were legal consequences. There was physical punishment. Substitutionary. Jesus came and took the legal consequences in our place. Atonement. Sin was paid for. The wrath of God was propitiated. Doesn't that feel good? You can say that in your car ride home and feel better about yourself. Propitiated. And then what's weird uh, in our culture, have you, in this kind of reformed baptistic waters that we swim in, we love having very straight lines, and it's this or that. And so do you, there's all these theories of the atonement, and is it this one or is it that one? 
And you are allowed to just say, yes, we're allowed to be a people who believe more than one thing happened at the cross. Do we affirm penal substitutionary atonement? Yes, absolutely. We also affirm another theory called Christus Victor. And that can make you feel very smart and happy. It's a Latin word that means Christ is victorious. So what happened at the cross? Did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Yes, absolutely. And he also asserted total victory over all of our enemies. Did he assert victory over sin by dying? Yes and amen. Over death through his resurrection? Yes and amen. And also total victory over spiritual oppression from the unseen realm. Not just over sin, not just over death, but over all the powers of evil too. May we be a people who don't try to reduce what the scriptures say just to have it make more sense to us, but let's enjoy the full mosaic of the scriptures and all that God has revealed to us. And so it continues. Now, Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God. And listen, and all the angels, all the authorities, all the powers except his authority. The creeds remind us that Jesus will bring us safely home. The creeds remind us that we are safe. This creed from 1 Peter emphatically, memorably, and simply tells us all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus. So if, if you are safe, which the creed tells us that we are safe, but I'm guessing more than one and more than two of us came this morning and we didn't feel safe. Amen? Anybody ever feel a little bit nervous walking into a church? Maybe you got something going. Maybe it's Father's Day. I mean, it is Father's Day, and that's a weird day. Maybe you missed your dad, and you're still mad at your dad, or you loved your dad, or you wish that you had more of a relationship with your dad. And so most of us come wanting to feel safe. So if you're here and you want to feel safe, I, I plead with you. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And, and here's some of what that might look like. Um, at some point this week, I can almost guarantee you, a little voice will appear in your head to remind you how awful you are. Have you heard, has this voice ever visited you before? You're, you're just driving down the street, listening to your favorite song, and this voice says, hey, do you remember when you were 15 and you said this, I just wanted you to know, in case you've forgotten, that you're terrible, everyone hates you, you're gonna die alone and you're a failure. You've heard this voice? Maybe it says something like, your life would be like this if you weren't so like that. Your kid would be different if you were not so awful. Your spouse would be different if you weren't so awful. The creeds, if all you read of the Bible for the next year was this creed, it would tell you that your guilt is forgiven. God is not a trickster. It's not a do-over. He says you are forgiven, which means he does not accuse you anymore. Uh, your father in heaven is not an accuser. What could you do with that voice then if you knew it was not God accusing you? Real simply, if when that voice of accusation comes in your head, if our first move was to say, hold up, wait, wait a minute. My dad doesn't talk to me this way. So this is not dad speaking. If you just could make that move, how might you respond differently to that voice? What might happen when that voice comes up? What might the creeds give you to say back to that voice. I'm not trying to say we need to go be like Martin Luther and wrestle Satan in our prayer closet and taunt him and throw our fists at him. Something very simple and reasonable that we, we could all do. When that voice throws your guilt back in your face, I wonder if we could say something like, this is not my father speaking to me, and I believe that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring me safely home to God. What might you be able to say to that voice? As, as a people, I don't, I, I've been trying hard these last weeks not to minimize the complexity of what we're facing as a culture, how confusing it is to be a Christian right now. 
but what might it look like to engage the complex issues of our day from a place of safety, of security, rather than from fear or anxiety? What might it look like to follow the way of Jesus? So I don't know, I don't have answers for you, but here's some questions to consider. If we believed that Jesus had all authority, anywhere where there's any kind of authority, Jesus has all of it. What might we do when he tells us to love our enemies? What might we do when he tells us to turn our other cheek to those who strike us? What might it mean to bless those who curse us? What might it mean, what might it look like for us to hunger and thirst for righteousness? What could it look like if a small group of people strived, desired to become peacemakers and not number outers, not shutter downers, not fighter backers? If we knew we were safe now and forever, if we believe that Jesus would bring us safely home to God, I wonder what it could look like for us to follow Jesus. When intrusive thoughts come, when anxiety rises, when the unseen realm stops being so unseen, I will tell you, our strategy is the same. We follow Jesus. The creeds remind us we are safe now and forever because Jesus is with us. He is risen. He is seated now in heaven, and all powers accept his authority. Did you catch that? As there isn't an election dispute in heaven about who's really in charge. Whether they are for him or against him, everyone accepts his authority. So be it in this life or the next, be it from things we can see or things we cannot, be it pandemic or persecution, be it Satan or circumstance, the creeds remind us we are safe. The creeds remind us Jesus will bring us safely home to God. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're willing and able, please stand with me and we'll pray.